So life can do some amazing things. As a kid growing up in the Sonora Desert of Arizona, I was amazed by how life had evolved to solve some amazing challenges and to thrive in an environment that many would consider a difficult place to live. So with, with innovations ranging from specialized cacti needle that can collect water from the air to insects that remain dormant for decades underground until emerging at just the right time in an explosion of life, I, like many people in the room I'm around the world, I'm sure, was inspired by nature's beauty, elegance, and power. Now, as a kid, I was also interested in engineering. And in part, this came through playing with toys, like this exact one you see on the screen here. Uh, this is an electronics building kit. Uh, at one level, it is a toy. At another level, it's about a half of a century of expertise and research in physics and electronic technologies boiled down into a kit. And the point is, when it's a kit composed of parts, it's something that anyone can pick up and very quickly do real engineering with the system. And what does that mean for the sake of today? That means you start with something you want the kit system to do, come up with a design to make it happen, you build it, and it works. That's engineering in a nutshell, okay? And so what's really exciting about today is the emerging possibility that we might be able to do that same sort of stuff, but with biology as the material that we're engineering here. So in this case, the building box are composed of DNA. And what those of us who are in the field of synthetic biology are trying to learn, really, is how can we build new biological functions using these kind of parts? And an interesting question to ask uh, about why we're doing this now is to look at the historical analogy of the invention of the printing press. So when the printing press was invented, we first used the printing press to do exactly what we were doing before. We made Bibles. But we made a lot of Bibles, and we made them for a lot more people. And I think what was hard to foresee at the time was how that technological capability would not just make more Bibles, but shape the way that we use the written word to shape our societies and our civilizations. And this happened in ways that are both profound and, uh, and maybe a little disturbing, okay? So just a couple of years ago, we were at the state of technology with DNA engineering that was essentially cut and paste. We could make ransom notes, sort of. This is a nice ransom note from DNA. But that capability of cutting and pasting was already really powerful. All the biotechnology we have in practice today came from being able to do this cutting and pasting of DNA. Where we are today, though, is a whole other ball game. And so with advanced DNA synthesis technologies, we can synthesize from scratch entire genes and even entire genomes. What that means for me as a synthetic biologist is I can type a sequence of DNA into a computer, stuff happens, and I get that piece of DNA that I can then use in my lab. And so that not only makes it faster to do the things we were doing before, but it means we can maybe do entirely different types of things that we haven't envisioned previously. And so one question then is, what do we build? What should we start trying to do? Uh, one thing to note is that cells can do some amazing things. This video I'm showing you in the corner of the slide is an immune cell chasing relentlessly after a bacterium. And eventually it's going to catch and engulf that bacterium. And once we realize we have the ability to synthesize DNA, it doesn't mean we're able yet to build complex functions like you see with the cell chasing the bacterium yet. And so what early synthetic biologists did was take inspiration from movies like this and instead try to build up simpler functions to start to learn how to build up behaviors that are ultimately useful like this. So this movie that I'm showing you is of a series of engineered bacteria. And they were engineered to carry out a simple program, which in this case is to periodically express a fluorescent gene. So what you're watching is as those bacteria sped up over time, as they grow and divide, they are blinking effectively as this fluorescent protein is turned on and off inside the cells. So this movie was filmed about a decade and a half ago and was the first real example of showing that we could build new biological programs up using this kind of technology. And it inspired thousands of scientists and engineers, including me, to try to jump into this field and see what else we could do with this technology. And so what I think the next question is, what kind of useful things can we now do with this technology? And one of the first answers to that was to start thinking about cells as factories, cells as potentially sustainable sources of materials that we need. A good way to think about how that can help us is to use the case of treating the global ongoing scourge of malaria. Now, you may know this, but one of the challenges of treating malaria is that we have drugs that we know help people every year with malaria. And an example of this is artemisinin, which you see in the corner of the slide. So the thing about artemisinin is that it's actually really hard to synthesize in the lab, and that makes it too expensive to reach all the people who need it every year. There's a plant, though, that does that chemistry called the sweet wormwood plant. And that sweet wormwood plant is a source of artemisinin. 
But the situation was such that with global fluctuations in the supply and demand of agricultural products like the sweet wormwood, every year there were people left in the lurch where there was an insufficient supply of this affordable and life-saving medication. So the insight was, what if we could take that chemistry that the plant is performing and perform the same chemistry in something that's way easier to do in a regular basis? And so that's what researchers did, is figure out how to take the genes that carry out the chemistry for making this drug and put those genes into common everyday household yeast. This is the same yeast that you would use if you were brewing beer or making bread, your high school, so making bread. Um, but the premise here then is you could take some sugar and brew up a batch of yeast that make this drug for you. And in fact, this isn't science fiction. This is a commercial product today. There are millions of people who get access to artemisinin brewed through yeast in this technology here. So cells can make a lot of stuff besides art artemisinin that I won't touch on today, ranging from other drugs to things like sustainable sources of fuels. But factories aren't the only things that cells can serve as. And another example is that cells can serve as laboratories. So in this one I'm showing you, a expensive laboratory staffed by a highly trained scientist can be replaced in some cases by a piece of paper on which a few ground up engineered bacteria have been spotted so that you get a simple low tech uh, color change assay that can, for example, help you figure out whether a patient has been exposed to Ebola virus or not. So laboratories and cheap diagnostics are certainly another use of cells. The one that I'm most excited about and where my lab works is thinking about cells as programmable therapeutic devices. And so I'll tell you a little bit about that area as well. Now, there's a lot of reasons why we're interested in trying to think about cells as devices. Cells can do things that we cannot do today with drugs and with other surgeries and medical technologies. Cells can heal, cells can produce therapeutics on demand, and cells can, as you saw in the video a minute ago, hunt down and kill threats. Now, um, I fully acknowledge that this picture that I had a hand in making certainly suggests that this is a realm of science fiction. Uh, but what I want to tell you next is that this is very much part of our real world today. So this is Emily Whitehead. In the spring of 2012, Emily was struggling with a form of cancer that her physicians had been unable to treat with every drug in the arsenal that they had in their hand. And that's five years ago or so from now. So Emily and her family decided to participate in a new experimental type of medicine where they took some blood cells from Emily's body genetically modified them outside of her body, and then put them back into her body. And what happened was, by the summer of that year, Emily's cancer began to go into remission, and shortly thereafter, every single cancer cell in her body, as far as we can tell, was eliminated. So this blew up everyone's mind about what we could do with this approach, and it literally gave hope to millions of people around the world. And so what I'd like to talk to you about today a little bit is how do bioengineers carry out things like this? How can we think about doing this for other um, diseases and applications as well? So the way it works in this case and in all cases is you start with a goal. In the case of Emily's treatment and treatments like this, the goal is you want to tell immune cells that they should kill cancer cells, but they should not kill healthy cells. And so one of the nice things and important things about that goal is that we can leverage a lot of the things that immune cells do well anyway. They get around your body, they can carry out this kind of targeted killing of invaders. And so what we as the engineers need to do is to create a program that just kind of directs the cells when they should be attacking and when they should not be attacking. So that's the goal statement. So how do we build a thing that actually takes what I said in words and instructs the cell to do that? And the answer is, we use some of the same exact concepts and even the same language that apply to that electronics kit that I started out a few bits ago. We think about these functions as composable up from parts. And in this case, the parts are encoded in DNA, and they include both that DNA and things that may be uh, derived from it, like proteins. And so by using that kind of idea, you can take an abstract goal, like telling the cell when to turn on, and come up with a sequence of DNA that I type into the computer, comes in the mail, and if I insert it into a cell, and if it then works, then we've got the goal, okay? And so this sounds straightforward, but of course I wanna highlight that this is super, super hard, okay? And we can, we're making progress on this, but to put some perspective on this, the sensor that was used for Emily's cancer took about two decades of work to figure out how to build that, but once we can do one, then we can build more, and now there are hundreds of people around the world trying to figure out how to extend this capability to treat not just cancers, but other diseases, and to ultimately reach many, many, many patients. And you'll see that coming in the next couple of years here. 
So we're really at the beginning and the early stages of this design-driven medicine approach, but already we see the emergence of synthetic biology as a true engineering discipline. And I really wanted to mention that to this audience in particular, because doing this requires people with many different interests and expertise. Biologists, computer scientists, mathematicians, anything you can think of really come together to make hard problems like this possible. And that's what's making this into a real engineering discipline. Now, one question we need to ask ourselves is where should we go with this? So this virus was synthesized from scratch from a piece of synthetic DNA. That sounds pretty scary, but until I tell you that this is actually a candidate vaccine for pandemic flu virus. And what was shown in this case is that if a pandemic flu virus was detected anywhere in the world, we read that sequence, within a day or two, we could start synthesizing candidate vaccines and potentially do that all around the world. And the reason why that matters is in the context of a pandemic, saving a day, saving a week, saving a month means saving millions of lives. And so doing it faster is a totally game changer here. We also have to, of course, think about potential misuses of engineered cells. And as an example, we know mutations that cause animals to build up ungodly amounts of muscle material that we see like on these slides here with this, uh, this uh, bull and a dog. Now, of course, we need to make sure then that athletes and aspiring athletes in particular are not coerced into doing dangerous experimentation on themselves. And we need to tackle these questions now while the technology is still coming about. We also have, as a society, have to answer questions that are hard, like this one. If it's possible to engineer an embryo so that when that child is eventually born, it eliminates a lethal hereditary disease, how do we figure out whether that risk and benefit balance out correctly. And if the benefits do balance out, how do we make sure that that kind of a technology is available to everyone, not in just very small number of cases? Big questions. So I personally take a lot of comfort in knowing that these questions will be answered in part by folks like you see on the slide here. Uh, these are just a handful of the amazing college students who've worked in my laboratory on the same questions I told you today. I'm showing this because these people are a couple of years older than you, and at least one of them graduated from this amazing school that we're talking about today. So the questions that we talked about, the opportunities are really being pursued by the people who are doing this work and who are really uh, right within spinning distance of you guys as well. So life can do some amazing things. And hopefully what I've shown you today is that if we work together to engineer and build with biology, then maybe we can do some amazing things too. Thank you.